Rackley, my pronouns are, oh, there you go. My pronouns are uh, they, them, or she, her. Um, I used to be a geography high school teacher, but when I got this mug from a, from a student, I thought, okay, my career is probably over. So uh, world's okay as geography teacher, it says. Um, now, there are, there are various reasons why I stepped out of the classroom, but I did teach geography for, for uh, 13 years in Norwich. And I've since worked with climate scientists, um, and now I'm an education outreach officer and freelance geographer. So enough about me. Now, before I go on, I just want to state, um, first of all, is that this isn't going to be your kind of classic, here is the layer, let's see what we, we can do, etc. and just basically almost be like a, a, a tutorial webinar, okay? There's a few reasons why that's not going to be the case, um, which will become very, very apparent as I go along. Um, but the, the, the fundamental thing is that um, as someone who is a climate science um, communicator, um, it's all well and good going straight into, right, let's, let's go, let's do it. But if you don't have the foundations of the basic knowledge and the, re the what you're looking at and why you're looking at it and what makes up what you're looking at, then it can all unravel and we can actually do more harm than good as, as, as educators, you know, even though there is so much robust um, climate science out there. That was my Bluetooth speaker turning off. So I'm not going anywhere. Um, so we are going to spend kind of the first third looking at the kind of importance of the, the data that's come on there. And I feel that's exceptionally important. Now, if you're watching this for a recording and you only want to get onto like the practical tips and ideas, perhaps because you're already happy with that, or whatever, you know, I'm not going to be, well, I'm not going to know, but I'm not going to be offended if, if you now skip 20 minutes and you go straight to that bit. That's absolutely no problem at all. But those of you who are here live, um, I think you'll hopefully you'll find it very, very worthwhile that you'll get this context. And then we will go on to kind of like the ways that we can use this new layer, how we can combine it with ex existing Digimap Schools layer. And uh, I'm actually going to get you to kind of see how you could map this to your curriculum, because I, I was starting to kind of put a structure in, in place for you all. But then I realized that we've probably got people from Scotland here with the standards. I've probably got people from Wales, probably got people from Northern Ireland, maybe even further away, not just England. And I have done in the past, like actually map things directly for the curriculum for you. But A, I've been out of the classroom for so long. And B, that's just a mounting task for me when I've got 39 helpers to do that for me. And you are the experts in terms of where things might link with your curriculum. But I will give you some steers. Right. So to start with, um, please do do pop any um, things in the chat as you so um, wish at any time. I love to engage on the fly. Um, I'm not one of these questions that don't wait till questions at the end kind of thing. I like having statements, comments, questions as we go along because I like to interact with you. Um, the links that I've put in the in the chat, they are to the Google Drive where you'll find a copy of this presentation and the Jamboard that you're going to need later. Um, you don't need that now. Uh, so please stick stuff in the chat as we go along. <clears throat> so the first things first is to be aware that when you're doing anything to do with climate information or climate data, we have got to be aware that there are certain uh, sources of authoritative data. Now, of course, today we've probably all been a little bit unnerved with with the with the news, the news today, of everything that's going on with regards to Ukraine. One of the things that they're cautioning about, of course, is that one of the things that they're really worried about is the spread of disinformation and how that can actually cause harm to people in, in Ukraine in particular. And I would go as far as way to say that in terms of climate change, it's the same thing is that you can actually do, do more harm than good if you're not using authoritative source. Now, as us as educators, it's actually we, a lot of the hard work's done for us. So you don't have to go direct to these folks. You don't have to go direct to the Met Office, although they do have fantastic educational resources. So I've got to keep my friends at the Met Office happy. Um, you can go direct to NASA's University of Reading or the University of Stanley where I work, um, Berkeley Earth, and even the source itself, you know, the IPCC, you could do. That's not, if you love that kind of stuff, if you're a geek like me, and, but as I'll demonstrate, you don't need to, but you do need to be aware of who these people are. So the IPCC is um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. If intergovernmental, as you can imagine, they work cross borders and in between, um, in between bo cross borders, and they also have the sign off of all the governments. They're a panel of different people of different backgrounds, not just climate scientists, but energy scientists, bio biologists, um, ecologists, you know, tons of stuff, engineers, all in the research stuff. Um, so which one of these is false, do you think? Have a quick little look at that. So researchers don't get paid to contribute to these reports, the big reports that come out. Uh, they conduct research themselves into climate change. The last report that came out um, around about COP26 featured over 700 authors across 90 countries. 
governments have signed off on the report. So uh, which one of these do you think is um, false? Don't know what, so one of, one of the, my co-hosts accidentally muted me there. So a uh, bit trigger happy. Right. So John is saying two, the fourth one. Governments, governments, yes, that's true. That one, Jonathan. Yeah, one. Okay, right. So they don't get paid. So one thing that helps with the authoritative nature of the source is that they're not in it for the money, despite some of the claims. They don't conduct research into climate change. They collate and collaborate the research together. So they just take what's already been going on and put it in one great big massive report. And all the others are true. OK, and this one's very important when it comes to using the Digimap stuff, that they're full of uncertainty, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, I'm not going to go through this. This is just to highlight that I have made a teacher's guide on the IPCC reports. I would say that it's not necessary for you to read that. But I think I personally believe you would feel a lot more comfortable teaching about climate change if you're not comfortable at the moment by giving that a read. So I've, I've basically, you know, teacher fired it. I've I've converted the basic conclusions from that report into um, something that's a little bit more user friendly and that you know when you go to the google drive and you get onto the powerpoint there's the link for you there but this is where i said that the work gets done for us so like for example the bbc do a fantastic job so the bbc use met office data the met office climate projections and they put little interact interactives together so and the best ones will if you scroll right down to the bottom of this page, for example, it will say where the data has come from. It will say, you know, the UK Met Office. So by proxy, you can treat this as an authoritative data. And it's great for the kids because it's interactive. So what will climate change look like near me? And actually, that's something that you can use alongside Digimap for schools when you, you'll, you'll see a bit later. So another one from, um, from BBC here, you've got here, how much warmer is your city? Um, how do your food choices impact the environment? That's their climate change food calculator. So just two examples of where they've done. And this is amazing. This is um, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Hannah Bloomfield. She is, or she used to be, she's moved on now. So she used to be colleagues. Her office was right opposite um, Professor Ed Hawkins from the University of Reading. He was the guy who came up the, with the warming stripes. Um, I don't have it with me, but I actually have a warming stripes um, COVID mask. So so that's an example of where someone has used authoritative data and they've come up with something visual that's really, really intuitive. Um, so that work gets done for us is, is, is my message there, right? And don't, I, I know some, some of you might, might not forgive me for this, but don't um, dismiss things like Wikipedia. It's not so much what the Wikipedia itself says, it's where they get their source information. So by, you know, by you, you can check with, the, the little um, citations and see where that's come from. Well, this sentence has been cited from um, this one, which is from NASA. So you could probably therefore, you know, believe, you know, think that that sentence is authoritative. If you've got older students, you can get them to go through that process. But OK, how can we check that the Wikipedia stuff like that? If you've got younger, younger students, you could start that one, but you could potentially do that process for them and make sure you're providing with, with the information. Right. So halfway through the preamble, and then we'll get cracking with the Digimap School stuff. So um, this is really important. Um, most of you are probably fine and competent and know the difference between weather and climate. Um, that is an assumption I've made. Um, some of you may be um, just need a little bit more clarity. This is what we're going to do now. So here is something I used to do with year eights um, to help with the difference between weather and climate. So which of these statements is weather and which of these statements is climate? I can tell you one right now. Today here in East Anglia, I um, don't know if any of you are in on, because I'm on the Norfolk Suffolk border, but today we've had rain, quite a bit of wind, sunshine, intimate sunshine. And with this intimate sunshine now, we've now had hailstones. And that's not climate, that's weather, isn't it? That's four or five different types of atmospheric phenomenon happening within a space of 12 hours or so so that is most certainly weather so sam is um where is this sam? says john oh same weather here in kent today so that must that's telling me that there's a there's been a front moving across our part of the east and the south so yeah what's happening today this very interchangeable weather it's it's weather suffolk oh yeah yeah so um that's been happening here 
Um, so things like in September, a terrible storm carried Richard's garden shed away. Well, actually, that probably happened a couple of days ago, I'd imagine. Poor old Richard probably had his shed blown away again. Um, heavy fog on the motorway reduced visibility. It rained heavily all afternoon. They're statements of weather. And this is a really good way of communicating with your, with your children, whereas these are statements of climate. Well, now, what's the difference? Look at the difference between the amount of time, the length of time, and the spatial scale as well, the area that covers. So you've got someone's garden, a stretch of motorway, and a singular location, right? Compared to Southeast Asia, Florida, and Egypt. So what's the difference in, in scale, spatial scale there? Where And in temporal terms, August, winter, season, compared to last night, um, this is obviously a singular event at some time in, and there and a moment in time and a day. So that's the main difference between weather and climate. So the stuff that you're going to, I'm going to show you with Digimap for schools are climate layers. They're not weather layers, they're climate layers. Um, right. If this one you should be okay with, but anthropogenic climate change is just the, the proper way of saying human caused climate change, right? Which scientists are, the, the, even the UK government has said in official documentation that the debate is over now. This is really important one uh, when it comes to the Digimap for Schools layer. Um, and that is the term climate projections. And that is computer-based simula simulations where they have, um, they set different amounts of emissions or different scenarios which produce different amounts of warming. I like to think of it as a golfer hitting a, hitting a rack of 100 balls and, that, and they're trying to hit that ball, those balls, exactly the same way every time. But because of the slight change in angle on the wrist, because of the change in wind direction, or maybe uh, a slight difference in how the power that they hit it or whatever, or the wind speed, there's always going to be a different result no matter what that, that swing. And that is the different kind of scenarios and you end up with a spread of golf balls they'll be clustered they're higher probability and you'll have some outliers now that is scientific uncertainty it's normal and it's actually very healthy and very good but projections have uncertainty which is very important to understand and the other thing to help, important to understand is that we've all heard of staying above two degrees celsius of warming 1.5 degrees of warming but what does that actually mean because 1.5 degree of warming compared to two degrees, that's nothing, isn't it? I mean, since I've I'm just looking at my weather station here, since I've been sitting here talking to you, my, the temperature in, my, in the house or outside has changed by 0.5 degrees. But again, that's weather and climate. So this is very important to understand. That temperature anomaly is the difference between um, a certain baseline. So in this case, pre-industrial levels is at the average between 1850 and 1900. So when we hear the term... 1.5 degrees Celsius, it is the global average temperature has, will increase by 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to the average there. Currently, we're at 1.1, 1.2. So that's where we are at the moment. That's why it's important to do that. Think of it as this bell curve. So we're shifting the bell curve. So the whole average is moving upwards, but you can see how individual extremes are changing. Okay, so the Met Office in their most recent um, climate report said that for example so us so some of you said you're in the southeast of england well at the moment you know two consecutive days or more of 30 degrees celsius they've been happening once every four years right but by 2070 because of this shift in average just by half a degree or something like that these consecutive days of 30 degrees c or more could happen four times per year on average that's an incredible shift. So you can see that's that's basically this dark red here coming into play. So that's another thing to bear in mind. Don't be confused by these small little changes because they can have, on terms of a weather scale, quite substantial impact. Almost done with a preamble. You've probably heard these terms, but they're important to understand. Uh, mitigation adaptation. So mitigation is trying to reduce the impact of something like reducing our carbon emissions, building renewable energy. Adaptation, you can probably guess. So a little quick quiz for you then. Um, which of these could be both mitigation and adaptation, do you think? So adapting to climate change and mitigating its climate change. Let's see how we're doing. Almost 20 minutes in. Good on time. Right. For those of you who've come a little bit late, welcome. Um, let me in the chat again put 
the links to the Google Drive. Trees, yes. Well, I'm bent. Green roof, yes, Rebecca. I was hoping someone would say green roofs. So that's the Google Drive to the presentation and to the Jamboard we're going to use in a minute. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so, and this is quite important. So, like tree planting and care, yeah, that's both mitigation because trees taking carbon dioxide, they help to um, depress the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere but they also can help you know, prevent soil runoff, which can cause flash flooding. They also, um, so they stabilize the soil. You know, green roofs are exactly the same. They help to help with the cooling of the, of the house, help capture some water. So in case of extreme weather events, but they also um, insulate the house and then it reduces energy use, et cetera. Good, you got it, fantastic. So that's really important stuff to know. So all this in mind, where has the Digimap for Schools data come from? Again, you don't need to know this, but you, in terms of the detail, if you are that well inclined, there's the link to where it will come from, if you love that kind of stuff. But they have actually taken the data from um, proper scientific projections and studies. And in this case, it came from the International Journal of Climatology, which is run by the Royal Met Society. Um, I do have a few, I think, I think some improvements need to be made. And I already spoke to the folks before I started, and that's okay, but I'm still very positive about this. And I'm going to talk about those limitations um, in a minute because it's very important to bear in mind what those limitations are. But I tell you what, this is a, a brilliant, brilliant addition to, to Digimap. So let's introduce you to it. And I'm going to get someone to give me a good thumbs up that you can hear this. We have added several new overlays to Digimap for Schools. We think these will be really useful and have lots of potential for exploring human and physical geography, right. as well as global climate. Let's have a look. To open the overlays menu, just select it from the sidebar. We have reorganised the menu. There's a section for overlays that only cover Great Britain, then world climate, world human geography, world physical geography, and the reference grids, where you will find latitude and longitude, major lines of latitude, and British national grid. To view any layer, just check the box next to it. In our world climate overlays, we've added temperature and precipitation averages. There are historical data and projected data, so these are really valuable for discussion on climate change. You could view the key to each overlay underneath it, as well as adjust the transparency of it with this slider bar. We've added population density to our world human geography overlays, so that you can visualise the number of people per square kilometre. OK, it's only more... Uh, only. A couple minutes left. Um, I'm going to play the rest of it because some of this is going to be useful for a bit later. This overlay offers lots of opportunities for considering where and how people live. For example, what geographical features affect where people live and whether the density of population is affected by housing types in different areas of the world. Pupils could measure country area or research total populations and compare it with the population density e.g. consider the USA against Germany. It could be helpful when viewing population density to switch to the world boundaries map to see the country names more clearly. You'll also find our time zones overlay here, as well as world place names. The place names are really useful in looking at our country level detail maps where place names may be written in different languages. New physical geography overlays include volcanoes, tectonic plates and mountain ranges. Lots to explore, and we're really excited about the potential this offers for embedding locational knowledge and meeting curricular expectations and learning outcomes. Get Feature Info can be used on two of the overlays, World Biomes and Volcanoes. Just select the Get Feature Info button and then select the location on the map you're interested in. An information box pops up. You can view more than one overlay at a time. You could, for example, view population density along with biomes to illustrate lower population density in areas of tundra or desert. Or you could try population density with mountain ranges to show how physical geography can influence settlement and migration. Was that was that your voice, Viv, on the, on that video? It was really no, nice. No, it was my colleague Emma did that one. Ah, oh, okay, nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, so thanks for putting the the long form of the Google Drive link because you you might you just might have been having problems using the Bitly link. Right. That. So I wanted to show that off because I wanted to show you some of the other overlays that that have come online in digital schools and this whole transparency kind of merging of them because they're going to be quite useful a bit later. Right, if you have access to um, Digimap for Schools now, like you've got an account and you're on the, your computer and you remember your password, stuff like that. If you want to 
um, open up a new web browser and, and and open that up. Don't worry if you don't. If you if you're watching this and recording, that's quite handy because you can pause me. I'll just make sure I don't have a gormless look on my face. The long link. I'll put the long. Yeah. So when it comes time for the uh, the jam board, I'll do the long link for the jam board as well. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right. Okay, so on Digimap for schools then. Oh, have I lost my share? Have I still got my share? I'm still sharing my screen. Good. Right. So um, it's very easy to find this. Just the overlay tab here. And then you can use a drop down world climate. So just have a little little rummage, a little play with that. For those of you who can't access at the moment, because maybe you're on a mobile device or something like that, let's have a look, shall we? So, okay, let's let's give you this now, shall we? While I'm here, oh yeah, some of you are there already. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, Viv's done it. Thank you, Viv. Right. Okay. So I spent quite a fair bit having a little play around with this today which was quite nice okay so what we do then is that we um head over to to overlay so um i i, I kind of like the redesign because um i remember using this extensively when i was teaching when it was version one it was pretty good then but it's just so much more user friendly now. And the fact that all the overlays are in one place is absolutely brilliant. So as that video said, you've got quite a number of different overlays. And this reference one is just so useful, like with the latitude and longitudes. Like how I had so much problem teaching latitude and longitudes. Like I tried everything, like skipping rope on the floor, like peeling oranges. And uh, so uh, what I wouldn't have given to have had this still when I was teaching. So yeah, and and um the major lines of latitude, which I imagine is like the Tropic of Cancer, Capricorn, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but we're obviously interested in, in well climate. So um, so you can have a little go turning those on and off. Now, there are some things that I, I, I feel that there's going to be some improvement. It's like, you know, that you had on the biomes one, it said in the video, there's an exceptionally useful thing where you can use this tooltip information thing and click on a map and it will give you um i would want um i would want to have that access the same with the the climate ones because they are the shading and this is this is a, a general issue with regards to climate data in, in particular is that if you're hard of seeing some some of these shades are very very in, you know not very distinct to each other um and especially because, of course, the way that climate is, the distribution of climate is, you don't usually jump from, say, an area with an average of 20 degrees Celsius straight to an area of five degrees. So you're very, very unlikely to have like a pale blue next to a dark red. Very often you have, you know, graduated progression. So um, that's something that's a limitation to bear in mind. But I'm not going to talk too much about strengths and limitations because that's going to be partly your job. Um, there's a question, uh, Viv, for, from Aisha in the... Uh, chat there so these logistical uh questions i'll let the uh, the wonderful folks at digimap for schools to uh, to answer those because i know that they're on the case with accessibility uh, but i don't know exactly what the, what they're planning on that one right okay so as you've got that up let's have a, um, a look at what these are that's the most important thing so let's go back to my presentation here uh, so, so the obvious thing is you've got um, average temperature and average precipitation. So this is why I had to go through that preamble to understand what this means. So if we take the top one here, 1970 to 2000. So this is, so for that series of time, so 70s, 80s, 90s. So for that 30 year period, you've basically taken all the temperature information, added it up and divided by the, the countless number of days that they are, right? So you've got that average temperature for that point in time. So, so at this point here, just, um, just in South Texas, for example, you know, that would be whatever that shade of, of red is or, or that shade is right there between those, between those years. And then average precipitation, precipitation, what we mean is hail, snow, anything that falls from the sky and settles on the ground, okay? So that's precipitation. You 
it is accurate enough to say rainfall, average rainfall. Um, just bear in mind that when you're looking at, say, upland areas, like mountains and stuff, that it probably is more to do with snow than it is to do with rain. But if you want to call it, batch to make it a little bit more accessible, average rainfall, that's acceptable. Just bear in mind the other bits that come with it. Like today, the precipitation would have been counted as hail. Um, right. So then you've got the 2010-18 one. So that's the average of those, those well, nine years, because it's the whole of 2010, 2011. So it's nine year average. So I'm calling this the recent average temperature, the recent average precipitation. And then the previous, so <laughs> perhaps I'm just holding on to my youth here by calling it the near past rather than the past because climate data does go as far back as like the 1800s and whatnot. So I'm, I'm, gra I'm grappling at stores calling it the, the near past. So you've got the near past average temperature and the near past average precipitation, 1970, 2000. Now the projections is where we've got to have a bit of caution right these are near futures but the the temperature has been split up into minimum average temperatures so that's the bottom you know the lowest temperature you get in a 24-hour period so usually it's in the middle of the night isn't it so they've done an average of all those minimum temperatures and then they've done an average of all the maximum temperatures so the hottest part of a 24-hour period now that you could probably think of a limitation with that is that that does not really make it directly comparable to to the others uh, to the temperatures above so that's something you've got to bear in mind um it is more comparable with the precipitation though you can trust you can trust it's a little bit more within line with that regards but this is now we're talking about um you know the climate uncertainty and the other caution i would say as well is that is that there are i don't i'm not going to bore you with this there are countless different kinds of climate projections. It's just what good climate science does. And the projections that have been used for both of these are, I would say, a little bit dated. Um, so actually, some of these temperatures actually appear lower than what they are currently today, when actually we know that that's not going to be the case, because this, this, is, out, this is on like the anomaly side of uncertainty. So that's just to be very, very cautious there. And the, the precipitation one is a little bit of a, a pessimistic scenario, which we're probably not going to follow. You, could, you know, up, we go into a warming of about 5.4 degrees. So just to be cautious um, about using those projections, my personal opinion, and this is no reflection to map school, so I know that they're continuously developing this and they're doing a great job with this, is, is perhaps avoid these two for now while they get refined, but you're absolutely fine to continue using a, a, pre a precipitation one but using the difference between these two the near past and the recent is good enough in itself and can you can do a lot of things with those anyway okay viv's just put in the chat uh, a statement about accessibility um so which is going to be very useful right then so what do you think so here comes the the jamboard uh, link that viv put in the chat so i'll just copy that again and stick it in there so let's have a think of what we think so let's appraise this do what all good teachers do take a um a resource think about how we can use it how we can't use it and i'll repeat for those who weren't here at the very start let me repeat what i said earlier when it comes to teaching about scientific basis scientific fact data and things like that We've got to be aware of the data limitations. We've got to be aware of how the data is presented. That's just, that's just good teaching, good ethics, and good science. So let us assess what we can definitely do with this data set, because there are a lot of things we can do with the strengths, and let's assess maybe things we've got to be cautious with. And let's do that as a group so we can support each other. And, um, and Viv, Viv and Laura, this is, this is free feedback and evaluation for you, I guess. Um, I'm not directed to do this. I'm a free spirit on all this, right? Okay. And Laura and Viv and everybody at Digimap for Schools have trusted me that I, I, I am doing this in a professional manner. Right. So let's go over to our Jamboard. Um, okay. So I know not, again, not all of you can access the Jamboard. Fine. You are more than welcome to go and get a cup of tea, go for a wee while we do this for just a few minutes. Um, you're more than welcome to sit and watch us and see what we put on there. That's not a problem at all. Right. And I always like to see, is that an axolotl? We've got an axolotl. I've wanted, waited for ages to get an, an anonymous axolotl. That's incredible. Chipmunk, armadillo, buffalo. Um, oh God, I never pronounced that one. Anyway, so what we're going to do here is, um, let's see. 
use the post-it note function. And then it kind of like the pink and oranges, things that we think is a limitation. And then the, the brighter ones. So the, 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 the two on the left, things we think are a strength. So let's have a, a quick bash. If, if we just do this for two, three minutes between the 22 of us, 23 of us, I bet we can come up with some ideas. So, so I've got here the fact that the data set is quite coarse. So you can't actually zoom in on an individual city because it, it doesn't cover that amount of, amount of um, fine detail. It's a coarse scale. So there's some limitations with that, but there's some very good things to do with that. You'll notice that the um, projection for precipitation only goes up to 2029, which is seven years away. So there's a strength to that, but there's a possible limitations to that. Um, the fact, well, I've, I've already given the answer to this one, really. You know, is there strengths and weaknesses regards to the fact we've got minimum and maximum projections rather than something to compare it? And any other thoughts? So let's have a little bit of go with this um, using the sticky thing. So I'm going to, let's put the ones that I've already said, eh? So limitation. So so you see that for a limitation, that's what I've put there. I've put not directly compatible with the past and recent data set, but there is an advantage to it. You can you all, you, you all can do the stickies, yeah? Because surely I'm not the only person out of 23 doing... <laughs> so just the sticky note just here on the left hand side so you just click you just click on the sticky and then um yeah of course so you just click on this stick this this sticky note here and then what you then do is then you just um let's say that the the, the two on the left here we'll call them the 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 strengths yeah of each of these things and then the two on the right here the, the pink and the orange we'll call them the, the weaknesses the limitations to be a bear bear in mind of and it's it is of just a virtual notice board and with virtual sticky notes um helps to understand that you have that you Because teaching the year eights, weather and climate, it, I was quite, I wouldn't say shocked, but I was, I was surprised how, how that they were surprised that you would measure the minimum and maximum temperature in a 24 hour period. And I said, well, why would you want to measure the coldest a day would get down to and the warmest a day would get up to, you know, and then we had a discussion about why that was the case. So, so of course, one thing that comes to mind on a climate point of view is that minimum temperatures are really, really important because if you get to a point where climate change pushes the minimum temperatures up so high that that permafrost now no longer stays frozen or ice starts to melt even in the middle of the night, then you've got a problem. So that's why it's really, really you know, quite helpful to have a difference between um, minimum and maximum. <clears throat> yeah, people's my fine. Yeah, and, and there's, there's like one thing you can't do. So whoever, so whoever said that one, I think that's really, really good. Um, is that you've got, it'll be so, one of the best things about Digimap for schools is the fact that you can scroll into your house, you know, with most things, which is amazing. And that's worth the cost of Digimap for schools in itself. The fact my, my eldest Theo, who some of you might've seen previous webinars that I've done with Theo, Theo will just jump on Digimap for schools and just zoom into our local area and just, play and loves it like oh that's where I walk, how i walk to school and all that kind of stuff so you're right that 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 local is really really um, useful um but before i put something there that's a positive of this or a strength of this can anyone anyone else think of one right all right i'll do one then okay so um so it helps you to be able to see global patterns yeah that, which can link to the way the weather moves around, you know, the global circulation. Yay! Someone said that one as well. All right, I'll um I'll I'll cut off one because you someone's already said that. <laughs> 
So up to 2029, and so I'm thinking a positive there is, is this is like seven years. So it doesn't matter what age of your students are, your pupils are. It's like, this is the change that's happening like now. Yeah, that's going to happen within, some of them will still be in school within seven years, right? Um, of course, the limitation is with that is that a lot of, a lot of people talk about 2100, 2050 and all that kind of stuff. And this yet does not go that far, but it may do in the future. All right. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, well done, everybody. So if you, those of you who want it, if you want to keep sharing your thoughts, that's great. Right. Practical ideas. So folks who've been watching the recording, if you've, if you've skipped to this part, welcome back. <laughs> Don't blame you. Um, still recommend you look at the video a bit though, but here we are going to go with some of the, the, the practical ideas. So we've already mentioned one of this isn't it it's like the spatial and the distribution patterns and climate changes at a location there is a way round, sort of of this this lack of scale right so let's have a look at these couple of things so let's go back to my digimap for schools here my browser back up all right okay so yeah, so of course the first thing first thing it, you can do is is look at these these global patterns. So um, if you put on the lines of latitude, for example, you know you can have a look and see the climate distribution and how it links to latitude. So that can be a very very good discussion with regards to um, the fact that the further away you get from the poles, you know the, the cooler it is, the bluer it is, and the closer you quite. When you've got this kind of strange thing, haven't you? Where where along the equator, it's not necessarily the hottest, it's in between the, so it has those really, really good visual clues in this. So you can get the kids like right there is a really good one. Um, what else can we look at? So the other one is, this is when you can zoom in to, so what you do, if you turn off the layers and you zoom into your local area, so let's just go to Norwich, my nearest city. It's a bit sticky today my laptop so this is where i'm based see laura what i was saying about just before we started about the ear shaped that's why i i, I jokingly call it east ang ear because it's the shape of your ear um so then what you can do is that you can go to drawing tools and you can stick on a pin so let's put, put a pin on norwich <laughs> great so you put a pin on norwich and then because of the nature of the layers, you, you now need to zoom back out again, but at least now we know where Norwich is located. And then we go back to our overlays and then we turn on the recent one, right? So this is, um, as far as I can make out, this is the five to 10 degrees Celsius. So between 1970 and 20, 2000, the average temperature for Norwich was five to 10 degrees Celsius, right? So, and for most places, if you now go on to the next one, 2010, 2018, you'll see that actually in just that shift, that very short shift of time, space of time, we've actually gone up from five to 10 degrees Celsius on average to 10 to 15, um, sorry, was it naught to five to 10? Yeah, so it's jumped up by a, one bracket by five degrees is what we're talking about, about the accessibility, right? So you can see that actually in just that short space of time that that region's done it. Now you can see that some places wouldn't have, doesn't like it's changed at all. That's the limitation. So if you take like areas of London and the South coast and they remain the same color, but at least what you can do is you can say, so say if you're on the South coast, your color might not have changed and your kids might be like, Oh, like, no, it's not really changed. Well, actually you can have that conversation. Well, a bit further North to us has, has changed, which probably means that we might have gone from say, I don't know, six degrees on average up to nine degrees or something like that. And Viv's just put in the chat there, there are plans afoot to be able to compare two maps side by side. Oh, would, would, they, would that be a movable slider where they can slide it like that? Or just would it be just a static? It would just be two static um, maps. That's fine. So yeah, you yeah. have a window with two maps. You choose what you want on one side, you choose what oh, you want on the other. Now I've got that Ace Ventura movie where he does that with the... Oh, never mind. I'm, <laughs> random. I'm so random. Um yeah, so, so, that, so that's one thing you can do with regards to location. So I know there was a limitation at such a coarse scale. 
but you can still kind of make use of these patterns. It's really good. And because it's not very complex, it's not, not very granular, you actually can see those changes a little bit clearer. So the fact that that, red, that darker red has creeped up you know, our country is an indication of change in itself. And uh, just, to, just to illustrate what I was talking about, about the, um, the limitation of the projections, is that you'll see it appears that things are getting cooler in terms of if I turn on the max there. So there's a misalignment between the, the data and the projections that they've used, which is why I rec I've recommended Digimap looks into that because it's an, it's an outlier. It's an old data or old projection data set. Um, right. Okay. So there's a couple of practical bits there. What else have we got? Right. You can have a go at this one if you like. So here's your challenge. I want you to find um, anywhere on the map on the 1970 to 2000 average. So the recent past, yeah, as I call it, I was born in 82. Uh, um, and if you're able to find some, I mean, I picked Greenland here, which is an easy one, but find where there's the change between the, the pale red, which is the naught to five degrees on average, to the pale blue, which is the, is it the minus, let me just go back. Is it the minus five? to naught yeah minus five to naught so basically you you change you change hues hues all right so i i i if you if you want to cheat you can do greenland with me it's fine but see if you can find somewhere else on the planet on the planet where you've got that differential i mean there's, there's iceland you can have a look use iceland right so you've got the 1970 to 2000 selected Here's a lovely one right on the coast of green. Look at this. So this is where I've done my example. So what all you do now, and it doesn't have to be perfect, you know, and there's always going to be that one kid though is going to go every nook and cranny, isn't there? Ah, oh, that would have been me when I was in school. Um, so then what you then, what you can do now, you can go to drawing tools and you can click on line or you could do area, but line's probably the best one. And then just basically trace a little bit just on the border of that pale blue. Doesn't matter, as I say, just, see, I'm doing it. Look, I, <laughs> Kit, don't be so pedantic, right? Just roughly trace that <laughs> limitation of this up one kit. You're going to have some kids who are going to spend 10 minutes just doing the line. Right, there you go. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the whole stretch of Greenland. It just be, you're just marking a boundary, right? Okay. Now, why do you think, folks, Kit has decided to do the demarcation between 0 to 5 degrees Celsius on average for this period and minus 5 to 0 degrees Celsius on average? What is the fundamental, crucial thing about those temperatures? This is the question I would ask the students. What's so fundamental about those temperatures? So if your average air temperature was just above something whoa ben are you on half term ben because you seem quite sharp today or is it or is it and john as well yeah so ben and jonathan's got it um yeah so you've got it it's it's that triggering point is it where you can have because, of course, don't forget, it's, it's an average of over 30 years. So there's going to be days, there's going to be years when it's slightly warmer than, than above freezing or slightly below freezing, of course. But if these general 30-year trends, 20-year, 10-year averages shift above zero, you know, you're going to have few. Remember that bell curve? You can have fewer and fewer days that are going to get below freezing, right? <laughs> it's... it's uh, Norfolk are back at school now. Suffolk, come on, the Norfolk Suffolk border. Suffolk are on half term this week and Norfolk are back. So it's a bit chaos here around here on South Norfolk. Right. So what you do now, hope, probably some of you have probably guessed what you do next, is that have that transparency up full. And the same with this one. So this is the 2010, 2018. And then, so I've done it in reverse, look. Um, but then if you flick between the two, you can see how that's shifting. So look, so if I go there now and then you get the kids to draw a new line and a different color, 
So let's go for uh, something very distinct. So that's kind of purplish, isn't it? Let's go for this brighter one. So this is why it's not important to get every nook and cranny because it's right now you can do all sorts of things here now so in this part of greenland you can say okay approximately how much is this you know this you can call it a thermal that's the you know that's the proper name for a, a, an isotherm if you want to use the proper term with kids it's the you know isobar isotherm the lines that join areas of equal temperature um you could say how how far is this isotherm um got the wrong measure there so it was uh this is what i haven't used the measure tool because that's when you measure a single line or you could do it like this and measure that line you can measure the difference and so this isotherm in the space of this this bracket has shifted right okay 5.4 kilometers so there's all sorts of things and then of course if you turn these layers off you can then start to look at the landscape and see how much that landscape might change. So if I turn these two off, oh, not surprising. These are coastal areas and these must be fjords and, and glaciers for the older students who know these kind of parts. So yeah, you, you can see how we can now go in down the, the rabbit hole in a good educational sense. Right. Crikey. It's already 10 to five and so much fun. Um, it's great when geographers get to geek out of each other, isn't it? And map, map lovers. Right, so let's go back to this thing. <clears throat> so there's another one. Um, and we already mentioned about the different overlays. This is why I played the whole video a bit earlier, isn't it, about the different overlays. So you could have the climate layer and the biome layer. And then as you, as you kind of like shift the transparency backwards and forwards, you can actually see how those biomes... Um, relate to the climate areas and when it comes to in terms of climate change you know if you start seeing a, a, a march a north to what we call poleward a poleward migration a poleward shift of our temperatures and also what you might also see if you look at the mountains you'll see an upward vertical shift in temperatures as well and then you put this biome, well, it's like, well, what, what, what biomes, what ecosystems are under threat because of climate change? So if the temperature for a temperate forest or the, or the tundra where the permafrost is, you know, and there's a nice little neat overlap with, well, if that temperature starts moving poleward, what's going to happen to the southern fringes of that tundra? So there's all this wonderful stuff that you can, like inquiry-based kind of investigation stuff that you can do with your students here using, using this. Um, another one you could do, where in the world are large number of people at risk? So um, you can use the population density map this time. And, and we, we know Bangladesh is very densely populated. And if, um, if you turn on multiple layers here, so I've got the population density, I've got the, the mountain ranges. Um, and then if you cycle between even just those two temperature averages, the 1970 to 2001 and the 2010, one to 20, 20, one whatever uh, that the second one the 2018 one you'll notice that that gets more red so there's a higher number of people that are, are going to be experiencing perhaps heat stress in that dense the other thing though if you do it the precipitation map it gets a shade it gets bluer so this could so we know that sea level rise is a very very big problem when it comes to areas like bangladesh and the melting glaciers off the himalayas is another but they've also got increased number, level of precipitation as well so they've got this three fold impact and of course if you see an area that's drying so it's getting paler blues in precipitation then there's the opposite potential problem is that these people could be in areas that be experiencing drought so this is really good at a good time between population density okay and folks to finish it off with the uh, curriculum mapping, if we return to the Jamboard, um, and that is, um, and this is, I'll come to your question in a minute, uh, Kim. So this is where the, the mapping comes into play. And I'm, I'm gonna leave you with this. So I'll get you started on this because of the time. 
And I would strongly recommend that you kind of like give yourself an extra five, 10 minutes off after a break or something, or come back to it later on. And um, you're right, Aisha. Yeah. And they, and then you have a look at this, but I just want to tell you how I've do it, done this. And this is from the Leeds DEC, which is uh, the, the um, development education um, center. They are brilliant and they have produced these climate curriculums and they've actually done uh, some stuff on maths and modern foreign language, RE and citizenship science. It's great for all key stages. Um, and this document, the climate curriculum is just fantastic. And I don't have time to take it through it. So, but you can have a look at it your, yourself. So what I would do is go back to the Jamboard here. And if you go to pages, so page three just gives you the link and, and everything is that I've done my best to highlight bits of their climate curriculum, which I think Digimap, this Digimap for Schools layer can help with. Now, I, as I said, for those who came late, I did say at the start, I was going to go pick out things from the key stage one to key stage four syllabuses, uh, national curriculums, and pick out the key things you need to do. Then I realised that there's some of you from Scotland, there's some of you from Wales, some of you from Northern Ireland. And I was just suddenly overwhelmed with, Ugh, I won't be able to cover all this. So this is the best way because what they've done at Leeds DEC is that they've worked with teachers and they've worked with um, academics to kind of look at all of that stuff for us and then come up with the way that climate curriculum should be and how it could relate. So what we're going to do here, same with the post-it notes. So Digimap for Schools can definitely help us to understand if it's between weather and climate because they put the data in decadal averages, right? So, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to put, um, you know, helps with learning averages in maths, right? So you just stick a post-it over or next to the thing there, right? So you can do this however you so wish. You can, you can mention something you teach, right? Um, a specific topic. Uh, you can mention a year group. So, oh yeah, you can just, so year three, whatever. Um, or you could put an idea down on this, right? So there you go. Look, this person says, I actually used Digimap to explain this to my year one class recently. Brilliant. Okay. So there's a few pages here. So there's, so this, this one is about the scientific background. So if, if you disagree with me, say no kit, this one that you've you've faded out, I actually think that this Digimap for School layers can help with this. By all means, stick a post-it over it, no problem, yeah? Um, I'm not the only, I'm, not, I'm definitely not the only expert here. You are more experts than I am. Um, so is, this is the urgent need for action. So the impacts of our changing climate are happening now. Well, the fact that we know that, the changes are happening within our children's lifetime. As I say, that, that first data set is only been ending in the next seven years. So have a look through this. And if there's something you think, ah, oh, that particular thing there, I can definitely use when I teach this part of the curriculum. And as you can see, they've got a fantastic way of showing it through progression. So they've got by the end of year two, this, by the end of year four, this, by the end of year six, by the end of year nine, and by the end of year 11. And what I really, really, really love about this is it definitely shows how you folks teaching key stage one how this should progress and link with the folks here who are teaching key stage four, et cetera. Right, I'm gonna check these questions. Um, oh, Vivian's already answered one about work. She's brilliant. Thank you for your words, Kim. On Digimaps, can you see the whole of the Pacific Ocean? So it depends what, I believe it depends what layer that you've got turned on. So I think I can cheat. Yeah, oh, so that this, yep, there you go, look. Oh no, you can't. Oh, so we need to we need to find out a bit about the wraparound then. Yeah, this is a very um, Western colonial centric position, isn't it? You can change map projections. Um, yeah. So you, but you can change the map projection, can't you? I think Viv, I've sort of seen that. So I've seen that option somewhere. Uh, because Greenland is not that. Sorry, side. no, you you can't select a projection. Oh, okay. So, on a side note, then this is a fantastic way of showing how the, how map projections work. <laughs> so, is Greenland really bigger than the whole continent of Africa? 
nowhere near. Oof. An order of magnitude less. Right. Okay, folks. Um, now, before you pop off, I spoke to Laura and I and I'm hoping that this would be part one, if you like. And then after a little bit of um, feedback, after a little evaluation, after you've had a get, bit of a go at it and you've seen how you've been able to apply this, then we can get some really, you know, really some collaborative ways of how we, we can go ahead and physically use this thing because it is such an amazing tool. I'm so pleased when, when the folks at Digimap for School said, oh, yeah, Kit, you do your climate stuff. It's like, we've, we've, you know, can you have a look at this for us? I was like, this is amazing because I already liked Digimap for Schools for what it could do. So, um, as we've already established, there are limitations, but there are far, there's there's plenty of uses that we can use at the moment. So um, if you want to get in touch with me, my email is uh, kit at jogramblings.com. You are always welcome to get in contact with me. Most of you follow, follow me on Twitter or on my Facebook um, or whatever. Um, and yeah, it's um, just get in contact. And if you have any questions or comments, just ping them my way.